Hey folks, welcome back to the Combo Classroom. I'm having a little bit of a weird internet at the moment, but hopefully it comes through okay. Internet stuff is always annoying when the internet cuts out when I'm in the middle of some sort of live chat online. It's my enemy, but also our friend because the internet lets you see me and communicate with me. Now, here today in the combo classroom, it just rained, so it's a bit chaotic. Everything is muddy around here, but still got time to do some learning and hanging out and stuff. I have a few cool mathematical things that I would like to share, but I also called this a choose your own adventure stream because I have too many things possibly to share in one stream. There's always plenty of cool ideas and things to show. So Sometimes it makes more sense to steer the stream toward sharing clues of future topics of math, sometimes to steer toward investigating weird science experiments or items, or weird stories from my life, or whatever. So what we're going to do in our little Choose Your Own Adventure today is occasionally we're going to have a choice, and when you guys decide which path we fork on, you got to make sure to lead me in a cool direction. Now, it's not a game you can really lose unless you somehow get me killed, so don't do that. But you can have the game be better or worse if we steer our Choose Your Own Adventure better or worse places. I thought it would be super cool someday to have a stream where there's little icons on the stream, kind of like an old-fashioned point-and-click adventure game. And we could have a little icon of different items and clues that I got when we go on missions to cool places. And we could have a little map of possible places to go to. And in fact, right now, we kind of have a miniature map, which is we have right here, combo classroom. And... The combo classroom right here has a few sides. So there's like a few little corners of the combo classroom. There's a little tunnel there with some bamboo and stuff. And then there's a big front yard with lots of cool stuff in it. So the front yard is part of our map, theoretically. And then theoretically, there's other places. There's an infinity symbol of crazy stuff elsewhere in the world. Sometime, like I said, I'll try and take you guys on a field trip down to the marina around here and see some cool birds and wildlife and stuff. But I need to figure out if I'm going to be able to stream while doing that because I won't have internet. So maybe my phone service will be good enough to stream. Or maybe I'll just have to film some crazy bird footage. In any case, here's our little map to start in case we get any reason to explore other parts of the map and in case any choices lead us to strange places now i got a lot of new classroom supplies so to just start off before we get into any crazy antics or anything let me show you guys that i did listen to the votes from before i said vote for what classroom supplies i should get more of and some of the votes were dice and you'll be happy to know that the last episode I filmed yesterday for the main channels, all about dice and about different little probability charts of different ways of analyzing dice that may be surprising to some people. And so I got out a lot of new types of dice for that. And then it rained and now we're really getting our dice carpet. When it rains and then you walk around back here, the dice get embedded into the ground. And that's great. It means that if I spill them, I know it's actually for the greater good, creating a dice carpet. Let's see if we can get a cooler view of this old uh, dice carpet that's assembling. My goal is for all of the dirt to slowly get them embedded in it. Some of them are halfway in and stuff. Some of them I may have to unearth from the dirt if it's a special type of die. I got a bunch of all the normal polyhedral types, all the wacky ones like that. But I also got some other special ones like blank dice, because with blank dice, we can write our own numbers on them. And, you know, that's going to have a lot of crazy potentials. You can do a lot like the episode that's going to come out on the main channel next that I filmed yesterday is all about how much you can do with six sided dice. And there's some stuff about 12 sided dice and other things and coins, which you could consider like a two sided die in a weird way. It functions kind of like one, even though technically now here's a thought i had a coin like a penny uh do you say it has two sides because it functions like that 
Do you see it as three sides because there's that thin bit around the edge? Or do you say it has infinite sides because the bit around the edge is circular and a circle is more like having infinite sides than having one side? So does a coin have infinite sides if it has the circular thing? And what about the ridged ones? How many sides do you count those as? Um, in fact, that was something I read the other day. There's like a standardized amount of ridges in them. To anyone who lives in America, you know, quarters. Um, let me look it up right here. It's apparently there are 100. Oh, this is weird. Apparently dimes have 118 ridges and quarters have 119 ridges. That's weird. Here, I actually have a quarter here because I was talking about coins in the episode. See these little ridges on the side? Um, they're like little bumpy things. Why is it one number off? I'm going to have to write down to research that because that's weird that they make dimes have 118 and quarters have 119. That there's something weird there. Why would they have it be such a random two random numbers that are one off? Some conspiracy cooking there. I'm kidding. Um, so someone's saying theoretically a coin could have two sides. Yeah, maybe someday I'll say I have like okay, in this rare bag, I got my two sided coins, but be careful when you open the bag, it might break the laws of physics. They're flat, and I actually mean flat. Um, now here's a weird thought. If those are, if two-sided coins are theoretical, what if you heard of some mystical, there's only one in the universe, one-sided coin. Now it sounds impossible, but maybe we just don't have the brains to comprehend it. Um, however, it is true with dice shapes, uh, they start at higher amounts, but with six-sided dice, you can simulate two or three-sided dice. So we're going off in the new episode about a lot of things you can do with six-sided dice. And um, I also got the blank dice because the next level is to put our own numbers. Because there's plenty you can do just with the numbers being one, two, three, four, five, six. But there's a lot more we can do when we put our own numbers. And here we're going to get our first choose your own adventure choice. So to whoever's hanging around here, you got to think about what makes more sense. Does it make sense for us to draw a cool dice chart? Not from the episode, but think about some random dice charts. Or does it make sense to look at the other items in the combo classroom and investigate elsewhere? So the other options apart from dice chart will steer us toward like books or fire pits or other things. Um, so what I'm going to write here in the back, too, for our Choose Your Own Adventure, possibilities. Oh, I got so distracted, I forgot to say. The other thing that I bought that everyone requested is colored markers. So that won the vote, colored markers. And we got a bunch of them. And what we're going to write as items we have here that could come in handy on our little game chart. Our items currently contain, in case we need a lot of dice, we have that. And our items also contain a bubble machine, some books, um, the fire pit is more of a location than an item. Wait, that's on this side. Hmm. It's around here. Fire pit. Okay. So we didn't have enough people around yet to have anyone want to vote on what makes sense to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a little dice chart in case we need one, and then we might just leave it blank. So by a little dice chart, I mean we're going to roll two dice. We'll do six-sided for now. But we're going to come up with a more interesting rule than you just take the sum of the two. You guys might already know the chart of what happens if you just take the sum of the two. Um, however, I have a question for you that might sound obvious to some of you and may not be as obvious as you realize that relates to part of the episode, which is 
Um, what's more common uh, if you roll two dice, normal six-sided dice, and take the sum? To get a seven or to get a number one off from a seven? So some of you may think you know the answer, but you got to think twice. So a lot of fun dice stuff, even with our six-sided dice. And I think that more games should have you do stuff related to dice, but not just take the sum of them. There's a lot we could do apart from take the sum. So we got a little dice chart there, but I'm going to accumulate some of the other items that might come in handy right here. We do also have some interesting books that I want to try out. And one of them that I ordered translations of all of the books of Euclid's Elements, one of the original really important mathematical texts. And they treat numbers very different, like distances and stuff, but it has some of the most fundamental proofs ever. Um, and to whoever said they're struggling with factionals, do you mean factorials? Or not sure what you mean on factionals. Um, we also have the really bad magic book <laughs> that I thought was funny. And then this last one, it says it's a book for kids, but this is a problem with our society. Awesome science experiments for kids. When I looked up trying to find books for cool science experiments, all the ones that have like simple, fun science experiments I could actually pull off, say for kids. But it's like, who says only kids want to make a laser maze or want to like make parachute flyers or to paint bubbles or to color rainbows or make a scribble bot. Why is this just for kids? So I feel like there's a lot of cool um, ones in here that we could do. For example, they have one about using a lemon to power stuff up. I have some lemons somewhere around here. My neighbors said I can use a long stick to take them off their tree. Um, so those books I'll put back in a safe zone just in case they come in handy. But in any case, those are some of the things that we restocked for classroom supplies. Um, and I got to make sure that since there's so many dead markers around doing crazy stuff, I got to make sure that the new colored markers actually sit in their own home in a safe spot. So we're going to put them in here. Wait, no, there's water in here. No, 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 no. Uh oh. Yeah, it rained back here, and the rain causes a lot of chaos in the combo classroom. But, like we've said, you got to respect the nature that helps the plants grow. Rain is still our friend. So, I'll just put these on the chair for now. They'll be safe. Now, for anyone who hasn't checked out yet, make sure that you check out the new snack break I put out on the main combo class YouTube channel just last night. Because we used this fire pit. And we cooked the, we burnt the spines off a cactus fruit. And then I was able to peel it by hand and eat it while touching it. Um, and so that was pretty awesome. That's a little fun snack break before the dice episode comes out. Um, someone asked what my favorite number is. And I'm going to have to come back to saying that there are some fundamental constants that are too important that it's hard not to say them. So we can't include them on the list. They're like too powerful. Zero is like the best number, but zero is too powerful. So if I get to pick zero, I pick that. But like a zero and I and one and negative one and some of those are just pi, E, those are just golden ratio, such fundamental numbers that they kind of feel like cheating. So let's say my favorite number that's not like one of those obviously fundamental popular constants is six. Took me a while to realize, but there's a lot of power in six. There's a lot of hidden power in three, but six takes the hidden power one, two, and three had in a lot of places. It's one plus two plus three, one times two times three. It's a factorial, a primorial, a perfect number, a superiorly highly composite number. It's all kinds of cool stuff. So 
Um, luckily, six right here we can see is the amount that the most common dice use. Smart choice. Although, would have been cooler if the common dice layout was zero through five. That would work more like bases of numbers or like modular stuff. So zero through five would have been better for a six-sided die. Um, someone asked if I play D&D. I don't. Um, in the past, I loved doing a lot of imagination-based games with my friends when I was younger, but I haven't really ever gotten into D&D. Probably maybe try it someday. It could be fun. I do have all the dice for it. I have some private students who play D&D, and I bet they're jealous by my, like, Hundreds of hundreds of dice. We're almost up to 2,000 dice, but it, I don't know like where they've gone in here. They're in the classroom. They haven't left the classroom. I can see like 300 or 500 dice, but there's 2,000 of them somewhere in here. Um, so we got some cool types. Here's dice and dice. These, you get two rolls with one. Roll it once, and the inner die is one, and the outer die is one. And with two die rolls or one double die roll, they'll usually have you take the sum, but let's do something more interesting. We're going to say, why don't we try one that wasn't in the episode? We had a lot of fun ones in the episode coming on the main channel next week, but here's a random example of something weird you could do that would change just taking the sum. This is one that also doesn't rely on the two dice being different. I mean, distinguishable from each other. Like here, we also could say the bigger die does so-and-so and the smaller die does so-and-so in their interaction. But some operations that work, whether you switch the two, like multiplication, whether you say A times B or B times A is the same or addition is like that, then... Those operations doesn't even matter if we have two identical looking dice and we don't know which rolled first or whatever. So we're going to do one of those, which is you take your two numbers that the dice ga gave and we're going to do their product minus their sum. So what's going to happen when we do product minus sum? Well, here we'll have... Let's start on this corner, actually. 6 times 6 minus 6. Wait, no. 6 times 6 minus 12, because you minus the sum, is 24. 6 times 5 is 30 minus 11 is 19. 6 times 4 minus 10 is 14. Looks like this one's going down four, going down 5 each time. Is that the pattern? 6 times 3 is 18, minus 9 is 9. Yeah, going down 5 each time. That makes sense, I guess, based on 6 being always the thing in the product and sum, and that going down 1. So this will be 4, and that will be negative 1. 6 times 1 minus 6 plus 1 is negative 1. In fact, we get a whole row of negative 1s. All of these, where one is multiplying by something, the product is the thing it's multiplying by, and the sum is one more than that. So product versus sum of all of these is negative one. Someone asked, what's my most middle number? What do they mean by that? Middle number? What's my most middle? Do you mean like on this chart, we could say what's the mode or the mean or the median or something, but what's my middle number? What's my most middle number? Okay, I'm gonna try and answer it. Sounds abstract, but I'm gonna take that to mean, we call a large, really a large number and a small number is kind of a joke of a concept because you can always zoom further in the number line. So all the numbers we talked about are small, but in our society and life, uh, we do encounter like something in a quantity of a million being large typically. And so I would say that the most medium number culturally is 80. I don't know. That's my rough guess right now. Um, 
Someone said the mean of all of my favorite numbers ranked, um, like the number that I like the middle amount. Um, so yeah, um, that's hard to say because once again, you can always come up with numbers that are worse or more boring than it. So like if I say that like, oh, the number 37 is not that great. Well, it's like, okay, well, it's cooler than 700,237 or something. It's like, there's going to be a more boring number down the line. So you can't really say, like all the numbers that we're going to talk about on the big scale are kind of secretly the S tier numbers. They're the ones that got mentioned. Um, however, it is good to think about means versus medians when we draw charts like these. That's actually one of the thoughts that comes into the episode that's coming on the main channel next week is how averages can be misleading. So can modes, depending how you phrase them, can be misleading. And you got to be careful with which type of data you're looking at. For example, because of my combo classroom, it's likely that on average, each house on my block has 20 dice and two and a clock or something. But I don't think any of the houses have 20 dice. I think that they all have like three dice and I have like 2,000 dice. So even if the average is like 20 dice, then I don't think any singular house has that. Um, now, someone's asking if zero is part of the natural numbers. That's a big debate of different fields and different mathematicians have different opinions. If you want to be safe, you want to stick with calling it positive integers or non-negative integers. And that clarifies if you want to include zero or not, it's included in the non-negative integers, but not the positive integers. I don't know if I can put my foot as a, my firm statement in that debate yet. It's I've seen logic to both sides. I'm going to hold off before I take a stance on the, which one zero is. That's part of why zero is too powerful. It's hard to decide where you're supposed to put it. Zero is, it, it is a number, um, but it breaks a lot of other rules that other numbers follow. So it's an infinity-esque number. It's not just the inverse of infinity, but it has infinity-like traits. Um, and then whole numbers, that's all, someone mentioned that. Whole numbers is even confusing too, because although it often means positive integers, you often hear someone call negative two a whole number casually because they mean it's not fractional. Um, so a lot of those terms are really confusing. If you want to be clear, then you say positive integers, non-negative integers, or integers, or something like that. Um, but no, you don't need to feel sorry for zero. Zero is secretly so powerful. Zero gets whatever it wants. It decides to break the rules and it gets to. And we need to put it in our system, even if it doesn't want to follow the other rules. Zero is a massive godlike monster. So it's doing okay. Um, and whoever asked how I calculate factorials, that you just multiply all the numbers up through it. So like 10 factorial is just one times two times three all the way up through times 10. Um, they mean a lot of things. They mean how many permutations a set of items have. But if you want to, you know, put it in your calculator, you just multiply all the integers, the, all the positive integers up through it. Um, and yes, zero is very godlike. Zero is like this void of zero is like what's beyond the observable universe and what's after life and what was before life. Zero is powerful. Someone asked if I play Cash Royal, if that's some sort of game. It sounds like a scam. I don't know. Oh, Clash Royal. I thought it was, I had my clicker of it. It's, it looked like Cash Royal. I was like, that sounds like a scam, dude. Um, Clash Royal? No, I don't know what that is even. I don't. It sounds like a video game. I don't play many video games. However, we're in a video game. So we, I ended up settling on making this chart. However, there will be choose your own adventures choices at some point. And people can remember that we have a little map here. So if anyone strongly requests that we go somewhere else on the map, it's a possibility. So 
First, we're going to fill out the chart. We're doing product minus sum if you roll two six-sided dice, or if you roll one double die, die in die. Um, so here we got zero. The only zero on the chart is going to be two meeting two. The product and the sum are the same. Um, this is going to give us ones because three times two is one more than three plus two. We also get a symmetry, so I can fill in two at once if I want. Like I know that since four is there, we're going to have a four there, nine. It's symmetrical down the diagonal axis. Um, so here, let's go fill them in. Two times four minus six, that's two. And this row is just adding them on. Two times five minus that. So two, three. So it looks like there's a pattern. It looks like this one's hopping ones, hopping twos, hopping threes, hopping fours, hopping fives, and so on. Uh, but that one looks like they start on negative one and do the hop. So interestingly, this one is going to make the odd numbers. Um, so we do get a row of the odd numbers and a negative one. And then we get a row of the integers from negative one. And then we get other hops. Like this is three apart, but it's not the three vins. These are the pre three vin throd numbers we're getting here. Because four times four, 16 minus eight is eight. That's a pre three vin number, one before a multiple of three. And then we're going to go three, four to the next pre three vin. Right now, I'm just calculating it based on the pattern, but I know the pattern tells me that this should be 15, and then I can check by being like five times five minus five plus five, that is 15. So if you do this, and this table is, if you are playing a game where you roll two six-sided dice, but instead of taking the sum, you take their product, like them multiplied together, minus the sum. So now you get a really more interesting game chart. If you have some sort of points, you have a lot of chances of you lose a point. You get a minus one. Then there's like some decent chances you raise a few points. And then it kind of starts scaling upward where it's like, there's nothing 20, 21, 22, but there's 24. And so you have a chance of getting a really high score, but the more common score is negative one. Now, this is a good example of when mode and mean and average and stuff are different. If we want to talk about the median, that would end up being like maybe somewhere around one or two or three. Um, it, probably around three would be the median maybe, which is like calculating all the steps inward until you hit the middle one sort of. And then the median, or no, that's the median. Yeah, the mean, which is the average, we would add them all up and divide it. That is harder to say because we have a lot of minuses, but we have that big 24. But even all the minuses added up would just turn that into like a, a, a 12 or 13 or something. And so I'm going to say that the average is going to be probably more like almost 10, like eight or nine or something, maybe. But it's hard to say. I'm not positive. Um, now... Oh, no, wait, because we're dividing them by 36. So, no, no, the average is going to be a lot smaller, probably. But if we say, like, approximately what these rows add up to, 30, 40, 60, 100, I'm going to say the average might be, like, five or six or something. I'm not sure. If anyone wants to, they can add them up and divide them all. But then if you just say what's the most frequent as a single value, the mode, that's negative one. It's most likely out of a single number, you'll hit negative one. So this is where you got to be careful. Like if this is a betting game, uh, you wouldn't want to expect negative one on average if this is how much money you're gaining or losing each time because you're going to have some really high ones that really offset that. But if it's a betting game where you're just trying to get the right value for your bet and you're not accumulating or subtracting, negative one is by far the winner. So there's a lot more that games could do apart from just making you add them. And this is a kind of obscure one, but that's because I put some of the simpler ones in the main channel episode that's coming out very soon. And once again, I thought it was going to be a 10-minute episode and it's going to be like 17 minutes or something because I always get carried away talking about a lot of random related subtopics. So now what we have to do that we've made our chart, I need you guys to pick where the choose your own adventure goes real quick. 
So we're either going to make another chart or we're going to look inside one of the books or we're going to look at some random plants and that might include the front yard and the books might include weird magic books or weird geometry stuff and the chart might include another thing like this. So whoever wants to leave a vote in the comments, we will see where we go next. So far, we have a plants and a books. Now, remember, since we have a self-enclosed map, if anyone ever misses what they want, we could come back to it. It'll still be accumulated. Um, in fact, we could make piles sometimes of the almost winter items that just missed the curve. So we need one more person to either break the tie or make it even a, more of a three-way tie. And think about, you want to see some math charts about dice. You want to see some strange books about math and magic. Or you want to see some plants. And in the meantime, let me see what's up with all this wetness. I'm getting kind of soaked just sitting here. I didn't realize the chair was so wet. Okay, charts. We did get the three-way tie. <laughs> And we got plants. So unless anyone else comes in with another one, plants just edged ahead of the other ones. So we can take a look at the front yard. I hope I don't disturb my neighbors too much, but we can go on a little field trip there for a second. Now, remember to also check out, if you haven't, the snack break episode I just put on the main channel, because that's about my yard too. And even though it's mostly just in the front yard to get some cactus fruit, I also uh, mentioned like what fruits are still ripe in this season. And when I filmed that a couple of weeks ago, there were guavas still ripe, but I don't know if there's any left, but we can see. And there probably aren't any apples or anything, but even non-edible stuff's pretty cool. So hopefully I don't disturb the people I share the yard with. We'll take a brief field trip. Now, what we got to check out first is some folks may find this grosser, but something that you need to make plants grow is compost. And here is a compost bin. So look away if you don't like gross stuff. Da, 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 da. Now I saw a lot of isopods in there. And in fact, if you look down here where the actual dirt comes from, that is just absolutely full of these little isopod roly-poly guys and worms. Ooh, okay, so I was looking for worms last time to put them in my planter, and I couldn't find them last time, and I see a bunch of worms right here. Oh, my God, that's a lot of worms. So we're going to move some worms to the planter before we see anything else cool here. So sorry if people don't like weird animals, but... Um, Worms in soil are great. I already moved a lot of isopods over to my planter. And at one point I moved a few worms, but I wasn't able to get as many of them. Now I got tons of worms right here. And these are going to be really good for my soil. Oh my God, this is trippy. There's like so many worms in this one little pile right here. They like all moved to this corner. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the worm haters. We're bringing some worms. So this turned into more of animal than plant so far, but we'll see some plants in a minute too. Oh, uh, there's a worm on my computer. Watch the worms. It's like on the buttons. Watch it start clicking buttons and like do something crazy on the stream. Um, okay. So what we collected is a bunch of worms. Look at these worms. Worms are really good for the soil. We have a policy in combo class, which is bugs are underrated. And if it doesn't bite or sting, 
then it's your friend. Or if have some other weird poison or toxin or whatever. A bug that isn't going to harm you and you just think is weird and slimy or crawly or whatever is secretly your friend. Look how cool these worms are. Like, these are cool animals. And they're going to be really good for the soil. Look at that worm. That is cool. Um, whoever said yummy, that just reminded me of this book I remember reading as a kid. Did anyone read this book where this kid gets a dare? He like makes a bet that he has to eat fried worms and he's supposed to eat a fried worm every day to win a bet. I remember reading a book about that as a kid. Um, I mean, by book about that, I mean fiction, I assume. Oh, no, I'm dropping all of my good markers. I need to keep the good ones. So those were some really good worms in there. The first thing we were going to plant in there is um, these potatoes and stuff. I was waiting for these potatoes to sprout a bit more, and then it started raining all over them. And I still don't know if that's going to help them sprout or not, but they're starting to go a bit. Look at that. We're getting some little green bit, like little alien bits coming out of it. So, you got any other sprouts? Yeah, they're sprouting a little bit, but they don't have a huge amount of sprouts in them. Uh, the rain might not have helped. And then we were going to put in an onion, which I have around here somewhere, and some garlic. Um, right now, this has ended up as like a storage space for broken clocks as well, because... The big broken blocks are dangerous, and I uh, didn't know where else to put them. Um, but thank you, worms. Hope you enjoy it here. I will make sure to give you some cool extra compost and more friends soon. Um, this pit looks like it would grow something cool, but it's not going to fit in there. Even if it had success, it wouldn't grow a big tree with roots. So that got us distracted but we can still look at a plant in the front yard because that was the request even though we got sidetracked by animals so and yes whoever said even the stinging and biting ones are friends that's true you yeah you can have friends you don't want to get close to sometimes um so Let's go check out the guava tree real quick. One sec. Okay, we got some friends here. We got... This is sassafras. That's the stray one I adopted. Let me see if he lets me pet him right there. He's really shy about where he lets people pet him. And like a year ago, this cat didn't let me anywhere near him. But now he is very, very loving. He loves cuddling me, but he's still really shy and runs away from a lot of stuff. So I'm not sure if he'll let me pet him here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good boy. Oh, and here's the fluffy one came down here. Oh, there it says. He got spooked by the fluffy one. They're friends, but it just spooked him. Where's Dandelion? Hey, Dandelion. All right, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the cats. So I keep getting distracted by the animals when I say I'm on a quest for plants for you guys. So here's the guava tree. Now, the method to test if any are ripe is actually just to shake it really hard. So if they're ripe, they'll fall off. Hi, Sasquatch. Very spooky. Okay, I'm getting cat distracted again. The cats are super cool. Um, let's see if any last guavas want to fall off this tree. Yeah, no more on there. That makes sense. The season has passed for those. They'll come back next year, hopefully. But we do have my cat, the Indy Lion. Um, so there's not much ripe left in the yard. 
there's going to be more ripe stuff coming around, of course, in the summer. That's when all the good ripe stuff happens. There are lemons. That Those are the lemons I said I can pick with a stick if I need. And it's not a season for as much edible stuff, unfortunately, but still a lot of beautiful little stuff in the yard. You got your weird little clover-like things. You got your little mossy-like things. And I think we'll probably, real quick, take a look at the cactus and then head back. So to take a quick peek at the cactus... This is the one from the snack break episode, and it appears, so this is the cactus. They make fruits uh, in the main channel episode. I just dropped a cooked one and ate one. It looks like one more fell since then. You see that one that fell? So I really do want to get that, but I need to get it with tongs or something. So, um, one second. I should get some tongs, and then I can grab that cactus fruit. So, all right, you guys, hang out for one second. Um, Dandelion. Maybe you'll watch Dandelion in the background. Maybe he'll hang out around here. There's Dandelion. He's down here. You can't see him. But maybe he'll come into the frame. Wait around one second. I'm going to get some tongs, and then I'm going to grab that cactus fruit. Okay, we're gonna pick up some cactus fruit. These are the tools I need right now. Also, some people are commenting on the video saying other ways of eating it and that some people eat the seeds and some don't. I spit out the seeds when I ate it because they're really hard and I didn't want them to chip my teeth, but there might be ways to eat them. Also, some people commented that it's not the normal recommended way to burn them on a giant fire. I know that it was more of a science experiment than a, trying to cook the greatest meal I could out of them. I also put in a flashback clip of a time I've eaten one normally. This one, we can decide how we want to eat this. Should we burn the lockets off? Should we just cut it carefully? In any case, it's going on a little mission. It's going to be kind of hard to hold this laptop and make it work, but I do it for you guys. I'm caught on the roses. This lab coat is good at catching thorns, but that means it protected me from them. Would have caught me if I didn't catch the coat. Okay. There's a big one. I don't know if it's ripe, but it did fall off and it has a little split in it. Looks kind of red. Like one side's greenish, but one side's reddish. And yeah, 
It's a big old cactus fruit. I still want to figure out... Ah, oh, I'm caught on the roses again. I still want to figure out if it's possible to eat the other part of it. Just because some cacti, you can just fry the, like, pad of it, like the green part. And I think there's one of those types. So, this is the cactus fruit up close. And uh, these are the little glockids or glocids that I don't want to touch. It's hard to even see that they are micro spines, but... Those little patches have like, each of them has like a hundred little micro needles that get new like splinters. You think that it looks like, oh, I could dodge the thorns and if I touch one, no big deal, but they're like different than big thorns. They're these micro splintery things. So that's the cactus fruit and the glockids that I burnt off in the snack break. And this one, we could figure out if we want to slice into it or what we want to do with it. So once in their first cacti stream, it has been very cacti themed in some of the streams recently, but that's not going to be able to go forward because this looks like the last cactus fruit of the year. So about once a year, there will be like three streams in a row that are cactus themed. <laughs> um, so let me take a peek at um, up here if we got any comments. Do, 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 do. If you catch them from the neck, they become paralyzed. Do you mean the cats? Because, or worms, or what? Cats, if you'd grab them by the scruff of the neck at the very back, they do have a spot that's designed to be looser skin there and be able to lift them a little more. And when they're babies, the mom lifts them from there. And if you have a baby tiny cat, you can pick it up by the scruff if you do it carefully and it doesn't hurt it. If you have a big cat, you don't want to just like lift it up by the scruff because that'd be mean. They're too heavy for that. But you can lift the scruff a little bit while you're like supporting their weight a bit. And they kind of like when you lift them up a little bit by the scruff and grab them there, it like soothes them. They have this genetic instinct that it reminds them of their mom. And so even the stray cat who like a year ago, he'd run away from me. Now when he lets me pet him, if I grab him by the scruff a little bit sometimes while I pet him and like relocate him a little bit while I'm petting him, he really likes it. It's like a weird genetic instinct. Um, someone's wondering about my hoodie. I just got it from my brother. I don't buy clothes that often because my brother buys clothes more often and I, he just gives them to me afterward because I don't care as much what I wear. Uh, he's younger, so they are hand-me-ups, I guess. Most people get hand-me-downs, but I'm cool with hand-me-ups. Um, but yeah, it's a good hoodie, although sometimes I worry that people think it's referring to some sort of astrological thing, like it's a certain astrological sign, because I don't really care what astrological sign people are. But stars are cool, and constellations are cool. Um, so cool constellation type shape um but yeah a lot of people ask about that i just don't have that many clothes so whichever ones i have i just didn't do the laundry more often and wear them a bunch and when it's cold out i wear this one a lot because it's a comfortable one with the hood um so someone's saying maybe the number line should be round because positive infinity and negative infinity are kind of the same. Now there are some ways of discussing it like that. So you lose certain traits when you try and bend the number line, but you do get other things. So one cool one to look up is the Riemann sphere. The Riemann sphere is sort of like a interesting 3d interpretation of the number line. Also the imaginary numbers, complex numbers between them and involving infinities. So there's a lot of cool ones like that. Now we'll probably relocate back to the comic classroom in a sec, because I do share this yard with other people and I don't want to scare them away from using it themselves too. But we'll come back into this yard at various points because there's a lot of cool stuff, a little less in the winter than the summer, but still a lot of cool stuff. So when we go back, we'll carefully relocate this cactus fruit along with us. Someone's saying, what does absolute value mean? Like it turns it positive, but what's the point? Um, a more instinctive version to think about, what does it mean to turn something positive? 
it's the number's distance from zero. So it helps sometimes just to say how far is something from zero. Um, and it's sort of like the magnitude of it in a way of like certain things can have a large size but be in a weird direction. But sometimes it's still good to know that they're large sized regardless of their direction. So similarly to how you could like have a vector on a graph and be like, this vector is going a different way than the other, but it's super long. You might want to like know the trait super long. So absolute value is kind of like that. Like how far is a negative number from zero or a positive number is kind of like how big it is in a certain way. Um, Cause it doesn't really make sense to consider bigger and bigger negatives or deeper and deeper negatives to be like getting smaller. You kind of can, you're like, it's getting lower. But you don't, it's not really smaller. Smaller sounds like one half than one fourth or whatever. So like negative two, negative three, negative four. Th there's a way they're getting bigger too as we go that way. Um, someone's asking my hardest class. Um, I don't know. Um, I probably subjects that required a bunch of memorization because I just wasn't <laughs> that inclined to learn it in certain subjects. So probably certain types of history or science that I didn't end up wanting to memorize the stuff that was in the curriculum. Um, but yeah, hard is relative. You need certain tools in your toolkit and then you need to want to work and then you need to work. So there's a lot of ingredients for stuff to make sense and work well. So I'm wondering what we should do with this one because we could just cut it open um, and we also could try another fire burning glocid type experiment. So here's where our next uh, uh, choose your own adventure choice comes back in. You guys get to pick back to a mathematical thing, cut open a cactus fruit, think about burning the cactus fruit. So those are the three choices I need you guys to run by me. So. Now, if we do think about burning, it might not be lighting on fire right now. It might be at the end of the stream or even a stream later today. But we would like set up um, a good little fire pit or something. Someone's saying both are quite dangerous, uh, dangerous in different ways. One's more likely to give me splinters. One's possibly could give me a burn. Um, so the thing is, I am actually safe with the fire stuff. I know it seems really crazy, but... Like I've said, the only time I've actually gotten hurt in the combo class is from clocks hitting me or stepping on the desk and the desk breaking and stuff like that. So the clocks and the desks have hurt me a little bit, but the fire has never hurt me here. Never gotten a burn from it. Um, so it looks pretty chaotic, but as soon as it crosses a certain point, I put a hose on it because there's a hose like five feet over there. So there's a hose plugged in right there. So you guys don't need to worry. Um, but yep, they are still dangerous looking. And I did put a disclaimer in the middle of the last main channel episode before I lit the fire because I want to make it very clear. I'm not recommending that anyone does this stuff. It's not a tutorial or anything. Not a challenge to try. Um, Someone's asking if there's a fire extinguisher. There is one inside. Um, I have to go run and get it, but there's a fire extinguisher not too far. But the fires have never gotten past the point where a hose wouldn't do the trick. They're always very much within hose can extinguish it in five seconds type thing. Um, it's surprisingly easy to put them out with the hose. Um, now, you do have to be careful, though, but... You know, when you really have to be careful, especially, is the dry leaves all around catching. And it rained here. So, like, the ground is soaked. So, it's actually a good time to do a fire because the ground is super muddy. All the leaves on the ground are wet. And so, there's not, like, stuff to spread. So, one said other route. But you got to pick. There's three routes. There's, should we cut open a cactus fruit? Should we think about doing an experiment with it? Or should we draw more math charts? So there's multiple routes. And 
the only clear vote is for fire experiments so far. That's the only clear vote that was asking for one specific path. Um, so yeah, if you want the other route, you can go with a math chart or cutting open a thing. Now, right now, we don't have as many people commenting, but at some point, I'll have a real big Choose Your Own Adventure stream, and I'll make sure that we have a cool map lined up and a lot of cool choices ready. So a lot of people are wanting the fire. So now here's the thing. Asking to see fire right now doesn't mean you'll necessarily see fire right now. It actually means that we have to collect sticks and stuff. And then we see if it makes sense to light the fire in this stream or later. So it mostly means save the cactus fruit for an experiment to do at some point today. I'm not sure if it's going to be the next 10 minutes or not. Uh, but we need to collect a bunch of sticks basically first to even have little logs to make it work. So I do have a bunch of parts of the desk still. Uh, but... Some of them, the other ones have like laminate on them and stuff. And this one's kind of long. Plus, this one's kind of holy. This one is the uh, grade negative one sign that burnt in the intro clock of the Combo Class main channel. So that one's an OG one. That's one of the clips that I put on the Patreon as a bonus video, by the way, if anyone hasn't checked that out yet, is um, the behind the scenes of when I first burnt a clock for Combo Class. I was limping around and in a lot of pain because I was... In about to get surgeries right then. Um, and I hadn't gotten both my surgeries yet. And so I was like limping around in insane pain. Um, in any case, stuff that is good to burn is like this. This was part of a fence, but it looks great to burn. It has little nail things in it. So we just got to be careful if we touch it. So I'm going to break it in half carefully. And then these will be good. Um, oh, someone HYP. Um, hyperbolic. Yeah, it could be like, there are different types of cosine like that. Um, so a lot of the trig functions have a lot of variations. And the names of them are kind of bad. Like, they could have named it better, which ones are called like co and then another one and which ones got their own name. Um, why did the chat go away? This happened once before. It like vanished to a view where I can't see the chat. Hopefully you guys can still hear me and stuff. Um, yeah, it's not showing me the stuff anymore. So I'm going to need to, <clears throat> to see the chat. I'll like open it on my phone or something. Um, I need some tech wizard on my team to figure out all this stuff for me. I could achieve great things if I had somebody doing the tech for me. Um, so uh, let me log on to the stream on my phone just so I can see your guys' comments. Um, all right. Here we go. So got your comments back. Now... Let's start collecting some uh, wood. So what I'll do is you're not going to be able to really see me running around getting all the wood. I can't hold the camera while doing that. But we'll chat while you see my collection grow. So that's where the collection is going to go. And little twigs like that help. But we're really looking for bigger sticks. And I remember that back here, there were some really big ones. So... Now, they are all wet now, which is a ramp. So that's going to be a problem. Yeah, there's a lot of wet wood back here. Um, I wonder if it'll dry enough to burn. Like, this would be a really good piece of wood, but it's soaked. Um... Maybe I can find some wood that's under something so that it um, didn't get wet in the rain. Some stuff had a little, like, um, roof. So the little twigs are fun, but they're not going to keep this fire lit too long. Hmm. Now... 
sometimes I do burn part of the desk, but you got to be careful to figure out what parts of it don't have like a weird laminate thing on them. Here's part of the desk that might be burnable. This is long though. I'd have to like saw this in half or something. Oh, I got a squirrel. Um, so yeah, it's going to be kind of hard to figure out. Do, 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 let me see. Yeah. And people say, um, asking about the streams. Yeah. Not that many people join the streams now because a lot of the people who are subscribed here, are just like watching the shorts and stuff. And I'm not sure how YouTube notifies people or not about the streams, but they will grow over time. All the combo stuff has grown very quick. I still like making them because people like watching them later sometimes too. So um, whoever is around for the stream, I still like doing them. But the more the merrier, of course. And people ask when I do that. Um, and yeah, no, it is a pretty big phone. I got it to film on mostly. Um, people, what was the other question? Do, do, do. do I do streams every day? I... Do not, but I do streams a few times a week, and I haven't set a fixed schedule yet, but maybe I will pretty soon. In any case, I try and schedule them a little in advance, so you can get a tiny bit of advance warning on the channel. If you happen to stop by the channel, you may see one scheduled like an hour or two before it happens. So this, I would like to say, could be good wood part of it, or like good cardboard, the side bit right here. This bit has wheels in it or something, so I don't know how that's going to work. Um, I really need to actually get some firewood. I should really buy a bunch of firewood because I'm not sure if we're going to be able to make a fire strong enough to burn all of the glokids off it enough for me to touch the thing. Because the goal is to burn all the spines off so I can touch it. Now, we already just did that in an episode too, but it is fun, so I wouldn't mind doing it again. Now, as much as you guys like the fire, I'll just light a little fire for you guys because I need to brainstorm how to make this bigger firework. This stuff is all like either desk that has laminate on it or is too big. I need to saw down somehow. And these little twigs aren't going to do like anything, especially when they're wet. So we can light a twig on fire if you guys want. But unfortunately, what we're just going to have to do is put it on our task list, our goals list is going to be here we had our items up here and here's we have the items we need goal so one of the items we need is firewood so we can see how whether like a wet stick even lights see yeah when they're kind of damp from the rain it makes it really hard to get them going at all now i do think i probably have another thing of lighter fluid somewhere oh there we go if i'm really careful i can move it closer i don't want the wind to put it out oh uh, yeah there we go it's like incense so This won't be hot enough to burn the glow kids off. So as you can see, it, the dampness is giving these guys trouble. And so we're going to have to just have collect firewood on our missions list. Oh, there's a little spark. Um, someone said the Remon hypothesis. Is it undecidable or is there a non-trivial zero somewhere? Uh, that is kind of the question of the Remon hypothesis. So I don't know the answer to the Remon hypothesis, so I can't answer that. If anyone knows the answer to your comment, they get a million dollars from the Clay Institute of Mathematics. Um, someone's asking if I can just poke the spines off. Uh, they are these micro needles. They're like these tiny little patches. They're not like one big spike, They're like these little splinter things. If I was really skilled, I could like take a cleaver and like cut each little one off really carefully like, ch -ch -ch -ch, and cut each one off with a little cleaver or something. Um, so that's one option. We could try and peel it with a knife by cutting each little outside bit off. Uh, but what I did in the past when I didn't do the fire technique is just 
cut it with a knife and try and like using two tools, try and scrape out as much of the inside as I can, which is kind of hard, but I can get a little bit. Um, it's hard to tell if they're even fully ripe, although they did fall on the ground for some reason. So that's a good sign. Um, now, someone said that people should vote for charts. We can do more charts. And if we don't get to more math charts today, this is the exact type of chart that's in the next main channel episode. Uh, but even cooler, more interesting ones. This was just a random fun one that didn't make it in the episode. Um, and yeah, opinions on zero to the power of zero and stuff and zero over zero, um, they're very often considered undefined. There are some fields that it makes sense to call zero to the zero with power one. There are other fields where it makes sense to call it zero. Uh, those conventions can help in certain different other formulas. But since there's no standardized way that works for all common types of arithmetic, they're often called undefined or um, there's... Other terms similar to that, that it might not be, as opposed to undefined, uh, zero to the power of zero might be called indeterminate. Let me look that up. Um, I think zero to the power of zero is uh, the term called the indeterminate as opposed to undefined. Um, but there are similar things where it doesn't line up with most fields of arithmetic all agreeing on the same value. Dividing by zero really is just agreed to not work in almost all fields of math. There are other ones that allow it, and then you lose other properties. So you can't just allow it without losing a bunch of stuff. And then uh, zero to the power of zero is some a little more commonly, uh, give, not like more common than not, but more commonly than dividing by zero, uh, given a value of either zero or one. But it's not um, standardized, and there are many, many parts of math where it just doesn't make sense to do. Uh, I mean, on a fundamental sense, it doesn't make sense, because zero to the power of anything is zero. Anything to the power of zero is one. So it's like it already can't fit both of the two rules that are supposed to be true for those type of things. So it's automatically going to have something wrong. Uh, I mean, like, at the least, if you allow it to be one, you have to, guaranteed, sacrifice either the fact that everything to the zero with power would have been one otherwise, but now they're not all one, or that zero to the anything power would have been zero always, but now there's a case where it's not. So you're going to have to lose a, a like good rule to allow that. So usually they just say, just don't do it. And then you can keep both of the rules. <laughs> um so people want some more charts. So the goal with these charts that we're doing right now, is, well, one of my goals is to not spoil the episode that I already made about these too much. So I'm trying to do ones that are a bit different than that. And um, the goal is to come up with a fun rule for how the two dice interact with each other. Um, as far as the two values going through some operation with each other and then getting a different type of odds distribution than you might normally get. So let's say, hmm, what's going to be a fun one? Okay, how about this? This will be a weird one. So with your two dice rolls, you divide the bigger by the smaller. Now let's just fill in the ones that work for that. And then let's see what our rule is going to be for the ones that don't work for that. So this row does get its normal numbers. So these will all make an appearance. Now also here we'd get a row of ones in our diagonal because anything divided by itself is one. So this chart's kind of cool. It gets our ones in the diagonal. And then... Um, if we do four divided by two, that's two, six divided by two is three. Four divided by two is two, six divided by two is three. Um, let's see. Is there any other ones or is that all? I guess that's all. So those are the ones that work. Now we could say that what it is, is an intermediate value, or we could say that it rounds in some way. 
let's pretend it's the intermediate value for now to have fun and see. So, or hmm, what should we do? Let's say that. Hmm. Well, what's the odds so far if we skip all the other, like if the others were re-rolls or something, we have six ones. Um, I think there's, tw wait. There's 20 numbers total here. So there's a, th out of these so far, there's three tenths of them are ones. One tenth of them are twos. One fifth of them are threes. One tenth are fours. One tenth are fives. And one tenth are sixes. Oh, but twos were actually a little different. Two or three twentieths of them were twos. No, no, no. Wait, four. Wait, no, sorry. So twos and threes, one fifth of them so far are. Um, so in this chart so far, four, five, and six are less common. This so far really skews toward lower. Like, this would be good for a game if the others were re-rolls or whatever, or you don't get any. Uh, this would be good for a game where it's more likely to get a low score and the high scores are a little rarer. Let's say, for example, that if it doesn't, if you get this many points, and let's say that if it doesn't work, you get no points. If you can't divide the bigger by the smaller evenly. Um, so if these were all zeros, this game, when you roll it, you'd have almost a 50% chance, but not quite, of getting a zero. So you'd have a slightly more than 50% chance of getting points on your roll. And Or we could have called those negative ones, too. That could be fun. You get almost 50% chance of losing a point, and you get 50% or a little over 50% chance of getting some sort of point, but it's skewed lower. There's... Higher chance of ones, next highest of twos and threes, then fours, fives, and sixes. So by dividing, we could do some interesting ones. We could also say, instead of dividing, what if, I'll do this one tiny maybe. Well, okay, yeah, we need to fit somewhere over here. So what if we said, what is the um, greatest common multiple? So... The greatest common multiple of two numbers is the biggest factor they have in common, the biggest thing they can both divide. Um, there's a sloppier, tinier chart. Yeah. It's okay. I just want to see the pattern that emerges. Um, yeah, whatever. So um, here the greatest common multiple is one. Um, anything by itself will be itself as the greatest common multiple. So now we get positive integers going down that row. And then some of these don't have any greatest common multiple. Four and two have two. So two has every other one as a two. Four has every fourth one as a four and the others as twos. Five doesn't get much luck apart from with itself. Three gets every third one's a three. And six gets a bunch of stuff. Um, six is cool, look. One, two, three, two, one. Six, one, two, three, two, one, six. Six is zero like two. So if we had called six zero, I mean in this cycle. So if we had called six zero, it'd be like zero, one, two, three, two, one, zero. That's cool. So um, this chart is interesting. That would be if we rolled for greatest common multiple of two six-sided dice. And let's see what the results are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, it's hard to count exactly. We can count the non-ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven twos, three threes, one four, one five, one six. So this is another one where there's only a single four, a single five, and a single six. Um, in fact, less than this. This had a doubled up single of them, so two of each. This has only one, four, one, five, and one, six. Only a 136 chance you get one of those. Uh, so much rarer in this game to get a higher score. Very likely you get a one. 
Uh, maybe in this game it would be like it multiplies you by something, so you usually stay at the same spot by hitting a one. Sometimes you double, sometimes you triple. Occasionally you get a super one. Um, so this could be a fun variation. Um, there's a lot more in the episode I made about these coming on the main channel in like four or five days. Um, but these are an example of how with two six-sided dice, even normal ones, or with one double dice in dice, um, you can do a lot of cool things that aren't just adding them. And so many games make you roll two dice and add them. And I feel like they need a little more versatility. So, um, let's see. Six over three is two. Yeah, you're right. I missed that one. So sorry. Six over three is two. You get another two there. Six over three is two. So, um, now anything else here in the comments? Um, someone's wondering about the Mandelbrot set. Yes, there are many cool variations on it. Um, one cool one that I briefly mentioned in video is Tetration Fractals. Those have some similarities. Um, my opinion on the claims the golden ratio is everywhere in nature. Um, I think it can be overrated how much people say it's in like seashells and plants and stuff. It's often other types of curves. There's a lot of curves. However, uh, it does show up in a lot of growth patterns of nature, uh, how things, their rates change in population and stuff. It does show up in some flowers, and it shows up all over math. So I'd say there's a way in which the golden ratio is overrated, and like, it's in every seashell when people say stuff like that. That's overrated. However, the number is not overrated. It is incredibly interesting in math, very fundamental. It is in ways the most irrational number. And there are certain types of growth pattern that at their very simplest are rate, uh, growing in a Fibonacci-like way. Um, and the Fibonacci series is linked to the golden ratio. So I would say it's overall rated fairly, but in the wrong way. Uh, gets as much credit as it should, but it's a little less in certain parts of nature than some people think. It's a little subtler. You got to you know, it's hiding in the midst of things, explaining things, but it's not as obvious as like, look, I saw a flower that was in its ratio. Um, so, yeah, um, the golden ratio is in a lot of places. It is actually in um, certain things like flowers and various plants and stuff. Um, and it's all over math. So it's actually is a very, very cool number. Um so, do, 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 do. let's see. So, yeah, a lot of interesting ones. And someone noticed the crows. There are crows. Um, someone's wondering, do I prefer advancement of just maths itself or practical applications? Um, as what I like investigating, I like studying pure math more as opposed to applied math. Um, that, you know, I'm sure there are many things in my life I appreciate that only work because of previous mathematics. So shout out to the people who are doing applied math. Uh, but personally, like I'd be more excited if they solved the Riemann hypothesis than if they like used primes to come up with a better computer encryption method or something. Um, so I am personally more excited by advancements just in math itself, but applying it is very important as well. Um, so those are most of the comments there. Um, now, I think I might, before too long, pause the stream, but that's because I might hang out with a friend. I might try and see if I can get myself down to the marina. And what I'll do is if I go on a mission somewhere, I will bring a backpack and see if I can get any firewood. Last time I was at the marina, it was around the time I was making the other fire, and I saw a bunch of sticks, and I thought, like, oh, I should have brought a backpack or something. Um, there were a bunch of extra sticks, and I'm not going to be stealing them. There are plenty of fine sticks there. Trust me, I'm very nice to nature. People need to be way more nice to nature. I never litter. I don't take random stuff. But when there's like 500 branches, I can borrow one to use in our fire. 
Um, and so, but do be respectful of nature and do not take too much of anything or do not take anything rare and respect nature because it's very important. Um, but I might borrow a few sticks because we need to make a campfire later. And I also still have some marshmallows from the other one. We ate a marshmallow on a breakfast stream once and I only cooked one marshmallow because it was like 10 a.m. or something and I didn't want to eat a bunch of marshmallows for breakfast. But maybe we'll do a more thorough marshmallow tutorial next time we do a fire. Um, there have been a lot of fires in the combo class recently, but I'm planning on cleaning up the fire pit soon and taking a little break from the fire pit. Um, and so we might as well get one more use out of it before a little pause on that. Of course, fire will return. Fire always returns, whether I, I can't even control it. I'm not in charge of whether fire will come back into everyone's lives. I didn't do it. So um, someone's wondering if there could be a formula for primes. And there are things you could call formulas for primes. There are uh, very complicated formula-like things that will tell you exactly how many primes are under a certain point or things like that. But they're too inefficient to run on large numbers. They require these like absurd types of sums and weird things, all sorts of stuff that wouldn't let you run it to test even if like a five digit number was prime or something. So to have an actually efficient formula for primes, um, yeah, you could theoretically try and reimagine things to try and have other approaches of how to figure out uh, one of the most common questions that is in math, which is how do the primes behave? What is their structure as they go down the number line? Things like, we know there's an infinite amount of them. We know that they have gaps that are arbitrarily big between them, but there's an infinite amount still. We don't know if they, uh, what, how the constellations remain close. We don't know if they keep happening two apart from each other as twin primes. We don't know what other constellations of primes keep happening. Uh, there's a lot of questions about where they can or can't live on the number line. And so um, certain types of number that we're not sure if one of them can be prime or not. And so things like the Riemann hypothesis are basically like trying to tighten up our knowledge of what ways the primes behave. So very interesting because primes are the building blocks multiplicatively of all numbers. So primes secretly are almost like all the numbers. Like it's almost like six isn't a thing. That's two times three. Um, someone's wondering if, sorry that I keep leaning off screen. This is the only place I have the comments. So is it possible to have a counting system on highly composite numbers than a given base? Um, yeah, kind of, you can have a factorial base where different powers relate to different factorials and stuff and you can have different bases where it changes. It's not the same type of positional as a rule. The problem with the base where you each place stands for a different type of thing. You often need, have a point where you need like an arbitrary amount of symbols. Like there will be some gap up in the number line where like, I can't express this without a digit 20 to put in this place or whatever. And so all the bases I've been talking about on the main channel and stuff are ones that kind of work in the sense of any integer and typically any number in general that you encounter. Um, you're going to be able to have a representation for it with the amount of digits that you start off with, which isn't always base number minus one. That just happens to be, I mean, between zero and the base number minus one. You don't always use the base numbers amount of digits. Everyone's addicted to being like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You're supposed to only use the base number amount of digits. But it's like, says who that's what works for the bases you have been using there these are other bases if you insist on not using as many symbols then you're not able to write this integer or whatever or you could write it in an infinite repeating decimal instead of with a normal finite chunk so there's a certain amount of digits a base can have uh, which are the ones i typically try and use uh which are the minimal amount of digits the base needs to achieve everything and in a typical integer base, the number is the size of the base. In something like base square root of 10, uh, it's actually better to use the digits from 0 to 9 still. Then you can represent any integer in a finite chunk. If you try and use less because you're stuck on like, 
no, 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 but it's supposed to be the number under the base is how many symbols I have. Uh, then you're going to need infinite repeating decimals that you wouldn't have needed. And so uh, there is an amount that can like iron out all the kinks and make it finite little representations for integers and stuff. And then you don't want more digits than that. That's the amount you'll use. Um, more would just make more places where there's a double or triple even at that point representation of a given number. Um, like if 10 was a digit, then 10 would be the digit, the number one O and nine point infinite nine. So we now have three things it is. Um, so if you have a base where the positions are something weird, like it's the next highly composite number or something, um, you need to double check that a certain amount of digits will like be enough at each stage to get to the next one. Because if you have a more chaotic type of like thing per base of what each or per position of what each is, there's a good chance there could be a spot down the line where it's like, uh oh, I can't write that number without the digit 20 to put in this spot. Um, so you have to be careful if the if they're all the same uh, for what it is like. Uh, this is the first power of this number, second power of the same number, third power of the same number, whatever for what your places are. It's a lot easier to verify or prove that a set of digits will be able to cover everything forever and not wonder like, hmm, is the 100th highly composite number how many times bigger than this one in that how many digits would I need? Now with highly composite numbers, theoretically, those don't have as exponential of gaps between them and the next one. So maybe it would work to do highly composite numbers but there would then be some times where you'd need like the digit three in this place, but up here you only need zeros and ones in these. So it'd be kind of weird. Sometimes you'd have like a higher <laughs> amount of one digit would reset to the next place. And here would be like a different amount would reset to the next place. Um, so it's possible there are ways to consider doing things like that that are interesting for sure. Um, you could uh, have it be something that has an additive basis of something, meaning like if the triangular numbers, if I have, I can add three triangular numbers into any integer. And so including zero as a possibility, that's triangular technically. And so uh, I could use zero, one, and two as my places and have the digits be triangular numbers, but that would take a really long time to represent um, but that is an interesting note. I'm actually going to write that down for fun. Try triangular number base later. Now, theoretically, you could even, with squares, use four digits, 0, 1, 2, and 3, I think. Oh, no, you need 0 through 4. Yeah, triangulars might need 0 through 3. Um, and then... No, wait, it's adding three different ones. Maybe triangulars could just use the digit one or two, if it's three distinct ones work. I'm not sure if you can get away with them always being distinct. In any case, there are certain things that have what's called like an additive basis where a certain amount of them can add to any integer. Um, and so that's something that um, could make a cool base theoretically. So lots of good possibilities there. Um, and Someone's wondering if I can challenge someone to a math duel. I kind of want to get in a rap battle with someone because I've been rapping for years and years. And I just, I'm a musician too of various sorts. I'm a music teacher and stuff. Everyone keeps saying I look like Jack Harlow on 5 million comments. And I've put on the table, I will beat that guy in a rap battle if someone sets it up. I'll also beat him in a math battle. And nothing against him, but I will destroy him. No, I mean, just in a rap battle, not like I have anything against him. Um, but so someone set me up in a rap battle against someone and I'll win. So don't worry about setting it up. I'll win. And a math duel, it depends what that consists of. Math duels back in the day where like you challenge someone to a weird problem that you've solved and see if they can solve it. Um, so I'm not sure what a math duel would consist of. Um, I want to get into like a legit math duel. We're going to have swords in my math duel. We're going to go Galois style. No, I'm completely kidding. The 
mathematician Galois, who was a brilliant mind, actually died at, I think, age 20, maybe, or like either 20 or young 20s, died from a duel. Not a math duel, but a duel duel. Uh, so we're not going to do Galois type duel, but maybe we'll be closer to that than the math duel because that's more exciting. I'm just kidding. I was involving guns. Don't play with guns, people. Or knives. Don't have duels. Maybe. Um, someone's wondering Tau or Pi. I like Pi more. Tau's cool. I see the logic. There are some formulas that it neatens up, but it doesn't the majority of them, in my opinion. So in my opinion, changing Pi to have Tau be the main one would make more formulas sloppier than it would make neater. So in my opinion, Pi is the more fundamental one. Um, someone's saying we count wrong. Only primes should be the real integers. Um that's an interesting thought. If you had to like make a fraction between each one of the next, the problem is that like some primes have arbitrarily large gaps between them. So somewhere on the number line, you'd need to like have like a prime with bigger than any finite number you pick amount of composites between it and the next prime. Um, and someone's asking about groups. Um, I don't know enough about groups to have a preference on the different types. Um, but I, cause I'm more like studying group theory than ready to teach it, but there will be group theory topics in the future. Very interesting, but we're going to start very simple. We're going to start with, uh, for example, the ones like, um, I believe it's Z three is that one of the ones that was one of the one that had sort of three or six elements z3 group um cyclic group z3 yeah we're gonna start with ones like that that are really simple like z3 um and ones like that which relates to three vin numbers is part of why that will be one of the first ones we look at um so yeah uh, group theory is very interesting and cool. Um, I'm not sure if I was even talking about Galois before those comments came or not, but he greatly contributed to what we know about certain parts of group theory. I mean, technically it's called Galois theory, his contributions, but it's about groups. Um, someone's wondering how to design an iterative equation to plot a desired graph. I mean, it would really depend on what you want to graph. So there's not really one answer to that. Uh, really depends on what you want to graph. If you want to graph a shape, uh, you could use these cool circular things that are um, these, I think Fourier may have come up with them uh, that draw stuff out. There's also, there's a lot of ways to try and graph stuff. So it really depends on what you want to graph. So one says they have a math exam on complex numbers and tips. Um, I mean, it really depends once again, what you're talking about, about complex numbers, but remember they're your friends. I guess one of my tips is that if you're stuck on a problem, try and work on it algebraically and geometrically try each way. So for example, think of points as coordinates on the complex plane. And also maybe think about traits they'd have, like if you squared the number and I squared is negative one, what a whole thing would square out to or whatever. So if you're stuck, maybe switch between, if you're using geometry and you're stuck, maybe try and use the numbers for a minute. And if you're using the numbers and you're stuck, maybe try and like plot the points on the complex plane or something in your head or on the paper. Um, and... Yes, lots of different cool comments. Um, a lot of these are like my thoughts on big topics that I can't really go into. So I'll mention more about stuff in the future about bigger things like what I think about quantum field theory. It's not really a one minute answer, but uh, interesting science going on for sure. I don't think uh, we're sure about any of this stuff. Whenever there's a new headline about scientists having a hypothesis, 
sometimes the headlines like to put it as if it's like they found a thing and then it like people don't read the actual article that says like oh actually this is completely a hypothesis they think there's a chance this is true some of the numbers line up with something so they think they could be on to something and so a lot of the discoveries are like that like something lines up with something else well so we're like okay cool we're going with that for now uh it's the best fitting explanation we currently have uh so i don't think any of that stuff's fixed or settled but i think that uh, definitely some interesting stuff about the universe that we're starting to tap into about trying to zoom in and zoom out and see ways that particles interact with each other and stuff. So I would say be skeptical about things, about any news about quantum science or anything like that. But um, it's definitely very important, definitely a very expansive, interesting field. Um so, yeah, someone's wondering how to find the square root of something without a calculator. Well, what I would do, let's say I want to know the square root of 450. I would pick a number that I think if I square it will be around there. So I'll say maybe 20 squares around there, and then I square that, and I say that's 400. I'm a little low. Then I might try and find a range. Maybe I'll say is 25 squared too high? and target in test a few numbers squares and if your square is less than the target then you're less than the square root um and there's other techniques you could try and do too you could try and if you know two factors of the number that multiply to it you know it's between those i mean like two factors that are in a pair so like if i know that you know, if my target's the number 1,000 and I want to know the square root of 1,000, then I could say, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, it is like 10 times 100. So I know its square root is in between those. Then I could try and tar go a little closer and I'm like, oh, it's also 20 times 50. Its square root must be in between 20 and 50 as well, because the factor pairs sort of narrow into it to a degree. Um, so let's see, based on just some quick thoughts, my guess is the square root of 1,000 would be um, 32. I don't know. Let's see, what's 32 squared? 1,024. I was pretty close. What is it actually? What's the square root of a thousand? 31.6. We round to my guess. With rounding, I was correct. Um, so, yeah, something along those lines. Well, and the way I did that in my head, I didn't list one of the steps, but I quickly thought 30 squared, that's a little under it. It's got to be just a little more than 30 squared. Um, so... That's a little way we could try and guess some square roots. Um, why is one person commenting a lot about one, the Henri Borel theorem on non-compact Riemannian manifolds? Um, yeah, uh, you're going to have to chill out with like 10 comments about that. You didn't even ask a question. You didn't even say if, you, if you, I'm supposed to explain that or if you just think it's cool or what. Um, Someone's wondering why pentagonal type, lazy caterer numbers. Okay, that's a whole other story. I'll get more into the lazy caterers numbers in another one. They're fun. I want to do an episode. Someday we'll have episodes that are like halfway between a snack break and a math episode where we'll be cooking like pancakes to demonstrate pancake slicing or I'll be a really lazy caterer to demonstrate the lazy caterer sequence. All right. This guy I'm going to have to remove from the chat. For some reason, he's really into this one theorem. Um, oh, yeah, that's they're all under the name of different relatives of Jesus, apparently. Um, that's really weird. Usually when you get a spammer coming on three different names, they're trying to get you to click onto their sex site or something. This one, which, trust me, don't click there. It's all scams. But um, 
This one was just trying to promote <laughs> a theorem about non-compact Riemannian manifolds in a really spammy way. So I'm sorry I had to ban you, uh, Jesus' ex-wife, as your name says, but just too many messages about Riemannian manifolds in a row. Um, <laughs> someone's wondering if you can demonstrate the construction for a square root. Um, do you mean like construction with... Um, like on paper where you use a compass and straight edge? Well, some of them are easy, right? Have a coordinate plane and I ask, how far is the point one, one from zero? It's square root of two away because we've made a one, two right triangle. So like if especially easy ones to make are if you have, um, the square of some integer plus the square of another integer, if it's not a Pythagorean triple, then the diagonal isn't an, a square number. And so its square root is some other thing. So like if I make like a triangle that has like three across and two up, that's nine plus four for the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 9 plus 4 is 13, so the hypotenuse is square root of 13. So, like, if I want the square root of 13, it's just the diagonal of a triangle. It's 2 over and 3 up. I mean, either of those dimensions. So, square roots are basically just diagonals of rectangles. Um, or distance between coordinate points. Like, the distance, if you have a grid, which you don't have on constructions with straight edge and compass. But if you had a grid... Uh, the distance between different grid points is often a straight uh, square root. Um, so let me see what else we got down here. Oh man, this person really has a lot of free time. That is that like all different accounts this person has? That must take some time. That is wild. One person is really spamming about Riemannian manifolds. I don't even know if it's that they want me to explain it or that they think it's cool or it's some surreal uh, joke or something. Someone said combo class greater than three blue on brown. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. I love three blue on brown. Um, I still think he is makes magnificent videos. I think that I still need to find a way to raise my production quality and stuff a bit before I can claim to be at quite the level of like how dope a singular video can be from his. However, the fact that some people think that is warms my heart. That is awesome. I do believe there are aspects of combo class that is the greatest learning experience ever. And as we keep growing and polishing up the craziness and getting even cooler and better, um, I believe we will become the greatest math channel. Um, someone said I look kind of like Jesus. Um, all right, cool. Well, um, I, I like Jesus. I'm not a Christian necessarily. I don't really ascribe to any single religion. Um, but Jesus, if he did exist, whatever is attributed to words that Jesus said uh, are good words. You should love thy neighbor. You know, you should. A lot of the stuff that actually was supposedly said by Jesus is very loving. Not always the way that some people interpret it nowadays. Um, so, although I'm not a Christian, Jesus is cool. He had a lot of, uh, I mean, if he was real, had a lot of cool ideas. And yep, the clocks do help us become the math, best math channel. But yeah, no, we have stuff going here that's different than all the others. Remember, it's just grade negative one. So if people already think that there's one of the best math channels, that is awesome because I have big plans and I know that the future grades are going to be even better than this one. Right now we have probably two or three more months in grade negative one. Probably is going to be the start of either February, March, or April, somewhere around there grade negative two is going to start. And that's why uh, I'm already starting to get all the cool supplies I'm going to need. So like I started the Patreon, I'm going to get a little money from that to use on camera stuff. And I already spent all of my personal money on dice, whiteboards, whiteboard markers, math books, and all the good stuff we're going to need for the grade. So next up is clocks. I haven't gone re-clocking recently. So we're going to get a bunch more clocks and we're going to be 
escalating on our way so that when grade negative two emerges, it's already cooler than grade negative one and obviously cooler than all the other channels. I just mean compared to grade negative one, it'll even be cooler. So thank you all so much for joining me. You're all super awesome. And a reminder that it's extra helpful for those who can support on the Patreon. But for anyone who can't, I understand. I have been thanking some of the people who are able to support there. Their names in some of the descriptions of videos. Uh, I didn't automatically put it in this one. Maybe I will later. But in the last like longer video on both channels, um, I thanked all the names of anyone who is um, supporting there. Um, oh my god, now they're spamming about the Banakhtarsky paradox. Um, I do like the Banakhtarsky paradox, but I'm not going to explain it right now. So, yeah, this one person is, how does it work to change your name? Are they going in there? Do they have one YouTube channel that they change the name each comment? Or do they have like eight YouTube channels? They're flipping between all named after different relatives of Jesus, I guess. Um... Because that takes some dedication to have eight different accounts named that you're ready to flip through all of them to try and spam about Banach Tarski, um, which is cool. Um, interesting paradox. I, some people overblow that one a little. It's not, I really like paradoxes. Banach Tarski is cool, but there are cooler ones. Um, but. Yeah, it'll come up in some episodes for sure. Definitely worth mentioning still. Um, someone's wondering when the next stream is. Now, here's the thing. I might stream later today to do a fire or to do some natural adventure or something. I'm not sure. What I want to try sometime is going down to the marina and trying to stream from there. But I have no idea if my cell phone service is going to make the stream visible or audible at all like i don't even know how people who do like real world streams do it do they just have really good cell phone service um because i want to try that but there's a chance the quality on that stream will be absolute shit so we'll have to see um I will try it anyway. We're also going to try some where, and someone said I should make my own paradox. Uh, I have written down things that I think are little ways something could be described as paradox. They're little paradoxical things that have come up um, in some of my notes. I will share more of those as we go. Some of the paradoxes um, relate to these dice. I'm going to have some cool dice paradoxes that I couldn't make with normal dice until I could draw the numbers on myself. Now I got blank dice, so we got more paradoxes coming. And there is some paradoxical stuff in the um, next main channel episode. There's stuff about coins and dice that might surprise you. And there are certain traits about it that um, when I that when I first thought through them, some of the charts kind of baffled me or some of the ways of describing a chart that the chart explained before I saw the chart almost. Um, some of the questions related to the charts sort of baffled me in a paradoxical way for a moment before... I kind of tried to click into them making sense. Some of them still baffle me a little bit. So we got a lot of those coming. Um, now, uh, the spam guy is now talking about Gradel's incompleteness theorem. See, I got to admit, although I don't like the spam, they have decent taste. They're naming actual interesting <laughs> theorems and paradoxes. So Gradel's incompleteness theorem for sure will be in an episode. Uh, that was in a really early episode I scrapped. So like one of the first episodes I made that I filmed and didn't really like and tossed had that in it, which I'll come back and make better, uh, which is about variations of the liar paradox, which can lead us down to the Goodell's incompleteness theorem. Um, so someone's wondering if you need more variables than alphabet letters. Well, then you go to the Greek alphabet. And when that runs out, you start going to Unicode. You just need a symbol, really. Um, or two letters if you need. You could use the whole words somehow, you know. Could use, uh, you could pair them so that you have a capital and then a lowercase, you know. So, like, they each get two. Sometimes that already happens where, like, if I want to talk about triangular numbers, I might say, like, T of N to mean the nth triangular number. But then if I wanted to talk about triangular verse tetrahedral numbers, they would start with the T. 
So I might even go like TR or TE. Oh, that's funny. The tetrahedral number N says 10. And 10 is a tetrahedral number. That's funny. So if N, if N equals 3, then this is true. Tetrahedral number N is 10. That's funny. I never noticed that one. <laughs> um, in any case, I think I'm going to close the stream when it hits two hours. So you guys got two, uh, 10 more minutes of my magic. And then um, you'll have to wait and see if I do another stream tonight or whatever. I've been going crazy for combo class and for work. I have a day job teaching students and I'm recovering from hip surgeries. And I spend so much time editing and filming and stuff. And I spent all of yesterday practically filming and spending a lot of tomorrow filming so that um, today I'm just going to let the wind carry me. Might carry me back to another stream later. Might carry me to the marina and I'll just film a cool bird or whatever. I don't know. If I see anything cool at the marina that doesn't make it into a stream, maybe I'll post some photos in the Discord or something. Remember to anyone who's not on there that a lot of us combo lords are chatting in a Discord, which the link's in the description here. Also that the subreddit needs more cool stuff on it. And of course that the Patreon's cool. Um, and that there'll be a lot more videos coming too. I still have some shorts and long stuff that I filmed for the bonus channel here the other day. Uh, when I was on a filming spree earlier this week. So I got a short one that's about grids and points, because I know you guys like shorts. Um, I got another kind of random short that's about a cool thing in my yard, about a cool solar panel thingy. Um, I got a longer one that's kind of silly to put out on this main channel I filmed that's about what is a clock um, and about <laughs> some weird clock-like things I got. And then there'll be the main channel episode about cooler versions of those charts. So apart from that, um, and there will be some, uh, for whoever is on the Patreon, I'm going to be posting more bonus stuff throughout this week too. A lot more bonus stuff to share with you guys. Um, but I don't know if the next room will be tonight or when. I'll determine a schedule at some point. Right now, it is still a bit of chaos because I'm making grade negative one from this dice-covered dirt. And we're somehow making it work. Unbelievably, we are. Let's see where we're at on the bonus channel. We're gonna hit 74,000 in a minute. It's absolutely unbelievable. The bonus channel is a hundred days old, approximately. In fact, it might be almost exactly a hundred days old. Um, let me see. Sometimes I like looking at how much time has passed between two dates because even if the dates are random, because they're just based on our calendar, uh, the amount of days that's passed is like a legit physical phenomena. Um, so let's see how many days has passed from when I posted the first video on this channel, including today. Today is exactly the 100th day I've been posting videos on this channel. I filmed some of them before cause I've been filming them since around the time I started the main channel, which was in the beginning of May. So some of these have been filmed as early as like April or May. Not this, obviously, but some of the shorts I had posted on this channel. Um, but this channel what didn't have anything posted on it. It was made like 103 days ago or something. And this is apparently the 100th day of posting videos here. So that is absolutely insane that we're about to hit 74,000 combo lords. Also, this channel is still not even on the partner program. It has like 20 million views and like hundreds of thousands of watch hours. And to get on the partner program right now, they're changing the thing for shorts later. But this year, you need 4,000 normal watch hours. I don't think they're counting any of you guys watching this stream. They're really weird with what they count for streams. And they count nothing from shorts. And so they say this channel has 2,500 of the 4,000 watch hours it needs to get on the partner program. But if you look at the actual watch hours, it has hundreds of thousands, but they don't count them because they're from shorts and live streams and stuff. So if anyone wants to help out, remember watching the longer videos on this channel or re-watching older streams that already happened is really helpful right now just so I can get it onto the partner program, which isn't just to monetize it, but it's also so you actually have creator support. You can actually like email them with stuff. Um, 
So, yep, we are at 73.9. In fact, about 0.95. So, in about 50 more subscribers here, we're at 74,000. That is super cool. You know what's actually cooler than 74,000? Is I got to look up what it is, but 42 cubed is just about that. 42 cubed is 74,088. So we're going to hit that tonight or tomorrow. This channel goes fast. So tonight or tomorrow, we'll be at 42 cubed. To anyone who liked The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, great book series. Um, that likes the number 42. So is it important? So 42 is important, and we live in a 3D-esque reality. Well, um, 42 cubed has got to be pretty cool. So... 74,088. So that's the number we're gunning for right now. Um, so thank you all so much to those who have joined me and helped support in any way, whether it's commenting or watching or the Patreon or chatting with me on the Discord or whatever. Um, hopefully today was a fun stream. There definitely could be a part two with Fire Later. Or maybe a chance that I'll even try and stream something from the marina, but that probably won't be today. And when I do that, you're going to have to help test out if you can even hear or see me when I'm trying to stream with phone service down there. We'll see. It'd be cool if I can. If I can't, I understand. And I will just film a cool video about birds sometime or whatever. Um. I had all these surgeries this year and I'm only able to get out into nature. Like now I like used to go hiking like twice a week. I haven't gone on a long hike in a long time because of all these surgeries. So hard, but it's going to be good because I'm getting out into nature more and more. And that's refreshing. Remember to all of you to make sure to once in a while, take a little walk and look at some plants, you know, stare at some birds or whatever it can be very refreshing. So, Today we had our little choose your own adventurous stream that we steered outside and in the future as we get bigger amounts of people joining the streams once in a while we'll do choose your own adventure style and I'll give you guys choices about where we should go next and like I said my goal that would be really fun would be if I could have the stream set up with someone like moderating it in a way like managing it so that they put little icons on the screen for what inventory I've collected of cool items and clues. I could like go around the marina with a backpack and whenever I get a cool clue, you vote for which clues I need to put in the backpack. And then those like pop on the screen like a little inventory item for you guys to see. Could also have a little map in the corner of the possible zones to explore. So I thought that would be fun. Of course, there will also be more math streams because... I didn't even show you any of the math books today that I had. Math books will be a topic for another day. Maybe we'll also get out some more Choose Your Own Adventure books when we do the campfire. Because so we did a Goosebumps Choose Your Own Adventure once, and that was fun. Um, but I am going to wrap it off when this hits two hours. I'm going to put the cactus fruit in the broken clock pile because... Um, there's already a lot of broken glass here, so I know that I already have to warn people not to go back there. So it's a good spot for another thing of spikes, in this case, glockids or glokids. And uh, let's see, still chaotic out here, a lot of mud, but we're making it work. We're having an awesome time here in combo class. I love making these videos and I love doing the streams. Just so you guys know, the streams don't even get me any subscribers. Sometimes I lose subscribers from streaming because people only wanted to watch the math video from a short or whatever, subscribe after one short. I do these because uh, they're fun and because I want there to be a lot of content for people who ever want to go back and watch. Who, If you're ever bored, there's me streaming about all sorts of stuff you can watch in the past. And because it's fun to interact with you guys live and I want to build our little combo community, even though it's random ones of you that show up each time on the stream, I haven't been announcing a schedule. So it's like different people who managed to make it to each one. Uh, we are slowly building our whole combo realm. So even though these streams do not help me subscriber wise, I like doing them. And as we go forward, we're going to have a whole combo class magical streaming setup where we'll have official days 
I'll have someone helping me so I can really activate my brain instead of worrying about the technology. And it will get cooler and cooler. And we are going to end the stream when this hourglass. Oh, wait, no. It had a head start. Wait. wait okay, so. Where's one that's, this one is like halfway down. Okay. We're going to end the stream when this hourglass goes down. Um, oh, no. Okay. Let me see if there are any last comments while our hourglass fades. Um, oh, no. I lost the stream because I was looking at the, uh, whatchamacallit. Um, oh, God. Now the guy's uh, spamming about Stokes theorem. Um, that guy must have just all day to do this. Um, the number on the green thing is, um, related to two by two by two Rubik's cubes. If there's a lot of numbers, but for some reason that one's like darker ink and like in its own zone that it always stands out. Everyone always mentions that number, even though there's other stuff. I need to like get a better ink on those that makes them look like that or something. Um, and let's see. Um, Thank you to everyone who's commenting. And someone's asking about mapping stuff on a Riemann sphere. I'll do a whole episode about Riemann spheres sometime. Too long to explain right now in our last grain of sand. But I will do a whole episode about them at some point because they're cool. Um, you guys are all super awesome. Someone asked if do the clocks work. Luckily not. They are right twice a day. Because by work, you probably mean try and be right and be a little off constantly. Uh, but if, if by work, you mean be right twice a day, they all work. So thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, stay tuned on this bonus channel and or on the Discord because I'll let you know if I do another stream later tonight, which is a possibility. If not, it'll be in a day or two. And I love you all. Make sure to check out the main channel to watch that snack break if you haven't yet. And I'll catch you all very soon. Huh? Okay. Since the technology didn't end, you get one last loving goodbye. I love you, and I will see you again soon. Yeah, it's just not ending the stream for some reason. So I guess we'll hang out until I figure out how to actually make it go. But you're all super awesome. And yeah, it just doesn't want to end the stream for some reason. Um, let's see. I wonder if that's because I have it open on my phone somehow. Um, all right, well, I'm just going to close it and it's going to end. So we'll do it the old fashioned way where I shut my computer.